Welcome to Health Talk. Today, we're going to talk to you about heart health. We've got just a list of wonderful guests that are going to be joining us today talking about different phases of heart disease and, and how to take care of yourself and be heart healthy. We're going to get started right now with two of my wonderful friends and co-workers at Pikeville Medical Center, Tanya Sloan and Brigitta Collins. I'd like to welcome them to Health Talk. Ladies, if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at the hospital. I'm Tanya Sloan and I'm the Cardiac Outcome Specialist at the Heart Institute at Pikeville Medical Center. And I'm Brigetta Collins and I am a registered nurse and also the uh, Cardiac Rehab Coordinator at Pikeville Medical Center. And we're here to talk about and to answer any questions that you may have about heart disease. Who is at risk for having a heart attack? Everyone is at risk. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you are uh, young, middle-aged, elderly. Uh, you know, we have patients that come into Pikeville Medical Center that have heart attacks that are even in their 20s and 30s. We have patients that are anywhere between there and 70s and 80s. So it is, everyone is likely to have a heart attack or can have a heart attack at some point in time. What are the warning signs and symptoms of a heart attack? Some of the things that you should watch out for are a general feeling of chest discomfort. It could be a pain, a pressure. Um, a lot of people will complain of epigastric pain or stomach pain. Um, a fatigue, sometimes uh, people will complain of a general feeling of fatigue. Uh, you can have jaw pain. Sometimes the chest pain will spread into the arm and you'll have some arm pain associated with that or shortness of breath. And with that, uh, women usually have they don't have the typical chest pain. They also have, uh, a lot of them will have the fatigue or they will have upper back pain. You know, sometimes they'll think, oh, I've just pulled a muscle or something. So, you know, they don't want to ignore those symptoms. They want to recognize all the symptoms that Tanya just discussed and then as well as anything that's out of the ordinary, even if it's just simple as uh, their upper back pain or in between their shoulder blades or, um, you know, like as she said, the jaw pain, that's typical for women too. And sometimes our diabetic population can even have what's known as a silent heart attack. So um, sometimes just a general feeling of, of unwell, it's important to seek treatment. How should you respond to any signs and symptoms of a heart attack? Uh, it's really important that you respond immediately to any signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Um, I'll start with what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just wait at home and see if the symptoms go away and you shouldn't go to the doctor's office or call for an appointment. You should pick up the phone and dial 911 immediately. It's very important that you get early treatment. Um, with heart attacks, time is muscle. So it's um, the more time that you waste uh, waiting to see if it'll go away, you could be uh, causing more damage to the heart. What are the risk factors for heart disease? Some of the risk factors for heart disease are family history, which we cannot do anything about, but it's very important that we all know what mom and dad, grandma and grandpa gave to us in their genetic history, because if, uh, mom or dad one had a heart attack, say at the age of 34, then the likelihood of their children having a heart attack at that age is very likely. It increases their chances. So, you know, we can't change their genetic makeup, but we can, uh, you know, know that information so we know that we're, we are predisposed to having a heart attack. It's very important that you follow up with your doctor on a regular basis, especially if you do have a genetic factor, a risk factor. And then there are risk factors that we can modify. We can, uh, if we have uh, hypertension, if we go to our doctor and he tells us we have hypertension or what's commonly known as high blood pressure, you know, they may prescribe some medication for you, and that's very important that you follow that regimen as the doctor has directed, but you also want to increase your physical activity and watch your diet to go along with that. So you can see that blood pressure coming down instead of increasing. Uh, you may have uh, what we call hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol is commonly known. So, and that is based on what's in our diet too. Lots of times if we eat, you know, lots of high fat foods, then, you know, if we just cut those out, we can see that that comes down a little bit for us as well. Uh, we have uh, what's known as physical inactivity. You know, we're very known 
for having obesity and overweight in our society, especially uh, in our state, and we want to see that come uh, to change. So we're trying to teach, you know, the younger generation as well as ourselves that we need to increase our physical activity so it decreases air weight. Uh, we want to uh, increase our physical activity. It's recommended to do at least a minimum of 30 minutes of exercise per day. Now, every step counts. You know, lots of us, especially if we're working or so forth or out shopping, we use elevators, escalators. But, you know, if we just take the stairs, then that counts. So every step will count as far as increasing your physical activity. And smoking is another risk factor that can, you can control as well. Um, smoking greatly predisposes you to heart disease. Uh, it does, Tanya. And also, uh, stress factor. If you have a high stress in your life, then you, know, you uh, need to do some relaxation therapy or try to take yourself away from those stressors because stress alone can bring on a heart attack. Even if you don't have any other risk factor, if you have high stress, then that alone. So it's very important that you get out and you do things that you enjoy. You know, read books or travel or, you know, just take a few minutes to meditate on your own time. It's very important. What kind of commitment do you recommend to assure good heart health? To ensure good heart health, you have to have a lifetime commitment. You have to have a lifetime of uh, commitment of uh, having lifestyle modifications such as, you know, planning on exercising 30 minutes or more each day or most days, at least five days a week is what's recommended by the American Heart Association. You also want to realize what the, uh, recognize the signs and symptoms of a heart attack are so you can get immediate care. And Pikeville Medical Center on their website does have uh, some signs and symptoms, and Tanya can tell you more about where to go and what that consists of. If you go to the Pikeville Medical Center website, uh, there's a link for EHAC, E-H-A-C, and what's that, what that stands for is Early Heart Attack Care. Early Heart Attack Care, uh, or EHAC, is a personal commitment that you can make. Uh, it's actually a pledge that you can make to uh, heart health and to recognizing the early signs and symptoms of a heart attack and making that pledge or commitment that you're going to act early on those signs. So if you visit the Pikeville Medical Center website, uh, we encourage everyone to take the oath and, and to make that uh, commitment that if you, if you or any of your loved ones or friends or family um, have signs and symptoms of a heart attack that you're going to call 911 and get help immediately. And once you go to that link like Tanya mentioned and you sign that oath, you want to be sure and spread that to your family, your friends, your loved ones so that they all know that that's there and they can go and make that commitment. You know, it's much pleasant, more pleasant for most people if you start a walking program with a friend or family members, you're more likely to keep that up so you'll keep that physical activity and keep that lifestyle modification going. Pikeville Medical Center is an accredited chest pain center from the Society of Cardiovascular Patient Care. And what that means is, is that our facility has met the strictest criteria for ensuring that you are receiving the highest quality of care possible at Pikeville Medical Center's Heart Institute. It means that we have the capability to provide uh, life-saving interventions in the event that you have had a heart attack, such as placing uh, stents within the heart. Um, and we have um, all the treatments available that you would need uh, to treat a heart attack. And then after a heart attack, uh, we provide support services to try to get you through this event. That's where we come in with cardiac rehab. We have a, uh, an accredited uh, cardiac rehab department, which we're very fortunate to have because a lot of facilities do not have the care for afterwards. So during the recovery period, you want to be sure that if uh, you're going to uh, do the lifestyle modifications. You want to be in a nurse supervised environment where you are uh, monitored with your heart and that you're monitoring your blood pressures and things like that. Uh, air departments in real close contact with the cardiologists, the family doctors, and either one of those can uh, refer you to outpatient cardiac rehab after you've had a cardiac event. So if you've had a heart attack or had a stent and intervention of some sort in the cath lab 
and then uh, or in open heart surgery, for example, or valve replacement, then you can come to outpatient cardiac rehab. And like I said, the uh, medical doctor, your primary care doctor, or your cardiologist or cardiothoracic surgeon can refer you to our outpatient cardiac rehab department. Uh, it ensures that you uh, return to your normal activities of daily living. It helps alleviate, uh, you know, some of the uh, symptoms that you may have. You may have some anxiety going on and, you know, every little time that you feel a twinge after you've had open heart surgery, then of course it's natural for anyone to get a little nervous over that and thinking, oh, I'm going to have another heart attack. So you're in a nurse supervised environment and we all reassure you and we know what to look for, what signs and symptoms, and we do uh, share that with the patient. We also educate you on the uh, ways to reduce your uh, risk factors such as obesity or overweight. Uh, we want to get your body mass index and your weight within normal limits and we teach all that to you while you're in cardiac rehab. We have a phase two cardiac rehab which is the phase that you go into initially after recovery begins uh, when you've had a cardiac event. We also have, and I'm very proud to say, that we have a phase three cardiac rehab, which is a maintenance program. It's the ones that have completed their phase two, and they have decided that they would rather, rather than going to the gym or doing it at home on their own, or in addition to those things, they come to see us a couple days a week, and uh, it's kind of like going to a gym, but they're there in a, with their support group. They're there with several others, and everyone in there has heart disease in common, so they do support each other emotionally and back them up, you know, say, oh, I've already been through that. It was a breeze. Uh, we are, uh, you know, proud to say that we do offer both phases. A lot of uh, hospital facilities do not offer cardiac rehab to as an outpatient service. So we are very proud that we do that. And not only that, but we are an accredited cardiac rehab department. Uh, we have air accreditation through American Association of Cardiopulmonary Rehab Association. So it is uh, very important, you know, when you search for a cardiac rehab department, you want to check on their accreditation. You want to be sure that you're being monitored with a heart monitor while you're doing your exercises. And you want to, uh, you know, be sure that you, it's a happy place to come to. I'm Roy Reeser. I'm the Director of Pharmacy at the Pikeville Medical Center in Pikeville, Kentucky. I've been a pharmacist at Pikeville Medical Center for my whole career, which is 35 years. Uh, I was originally a graduate of Pikeville College, uh, then went to University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy, and then my first job was at Pikeville Medical Center, and I've been working here ever since then. So uh, I'm here today to try to answer a few questions about how medications are related to your heart disease and uh, some of the things that you can do that will hopefully you better utilize your medication to treat your condition, whether it be high blood pressure or high cholesterol or whatever condition it could be an underlying cause of your heart disease. What are some of the major causes of heart disease? You know, a couple of the major causes of heart disease are, two of the biggest ones are high, high blood pressure, especially over a long period of time, and also high cholesterol over a long period of time. And so, uh, medica you know, a lot of things can be done with your diet and exercise and those kind of things, but a lot of times uh, medication is required. So today we want to talk a little bit about some of the different kind of medications that are used to treat heart disease and also some of the side effects and some of the best, best ways to utilize these medications. I would like to know some of the medications used to treat heart disease. Well, a lot of the medications used to treat heart disease are some of the antiplatelet drugs, which we'll go through those in a while, some of the different ones. Also, some of the hypertension drugs. There are several different categories, and not one class or one drug is a right for all persons. That's why your physicians will look and maybe use the combinations. And also, there are a couple of different kinds of drugs that are used to treat your high cholesterol. So we'll try to talk a little bit about the different kinds of uh, medication used to treat uh, high cholesterol and how sometimes they can be used together. What is an ACE inhibitor? How does it reduce blood pressure and are there side effects? ACE inhibitors, they're used to lower your blood pressure by reducing constriction of your blood vessels and therefore they make it easier for your heart to pump blood. And I, a lot of people are on ACE inhibitors. Uh, some of the ones, I'll name some of the ones and see if maybe some of you are on these drugs. They're uh, lisinopril, 
Captopril, Enalapril, Quinapril, Benzapril, Lysanopril, uh, Ramapril. These are the most commonly used ones. And uh, these are used in a combination, a lot of times they're used by themselves, and a lot of times used in combination with other types of blood pressure medications. Uh, some of the side effects of these are um, sometimes you have a dry, hacky cough. I'm, I've had people come to me and say, I've got this cough I just can't get rid of, and we might check their profile, and they're on one of these type of drugs. Sometimes the, the physician can change it to a different type of ACE inhibitor, and that will take care of the cough. Or sometimes they'll have to change it to a whole different class of drug because the cough is uh, very aggravating and something a patient will quit taking their medication if you do not change it to something else. What is a beta blocker? How is it used to treat heart disease, and are there side effects? Beta blockers are a class of medication that's used to treat hypertension. It does by decreasing your rate, heart rate and your cardiac output, which therefore decreases your blood pressure. Uh, some of the most commonly uh, used beta blockers are uh, atenolol, uh, toprol or low pressor, which is metoprolol, and natalol and propanolol. And the, some of the, the most common side effects of these drugs are they kind of, especially when you first begin taking it, make you feel kind of tired and a little weak. And hopefully after uh, some time you build up a, uh, where this doesn't bother you as much. But that is one of the side effects of uh, the beta blockers. What is a statin? Does it treat cholesterol? What about the side effects? Statins are a class of medication that's used to lower your cholesterol. And the way the statins work is they decrease the uh, amount of uh, cholesterol that is produced by your liver, so therefore your, if your uh, body will then have less in it. Uh, the biggest side effects of the statins are a lot of time is uh, your doctor will require you to have liver functions tests done ever so much time just to make sure your liver is functioning fine with taking this drug. The other one, if you have any kind of muscle pain, uh, that can cause uh, muscle pain if that is, so it's a condition that normally when you stop taking the medication it's reversed, but you definitely need to contact your physician because a lot of times he can change it to a different kind of statin and this will um, cause the muscle pain to go away. And uh, they're also a, a drug that's also related that is used to lower cholesterol, but it works in a different way. And the name of this drug is Zetia. And the way Zetia works is that it decreases the amount of absorption that your body does of cholesterol when you eat different kinds of food. So a lot of times uh, the statins can be given in combinations with the Zetia uh, for certain conditions and this, they worked in together to lower your cholesterol. What are blood thinners? Can you explain their side effects? A lot of times patients with heart disease, especially if they've had a previous heart attack, will be given some kind of a blood thinner, which will make sure your blood doesn't clot and cause a problem. Some of the type of drugs are these. They can be uh, uh, antiplatelet or they can be anticoagulant. Some of those common ones are Plavix. Uh, and the other one is aspirin sometimes is used. Also, a Coumadin, or another name for Coumadin is Warfarin is used a lot of times. And one of the, more, the newer ones used to uh, prevent blood clotting is called Pradexa. And one of the biggest side effects of these drugs is obviously if you get, can get too high of a dose, it can cause you bleeding. So you're always watching for excessive bruising to make sure your blood is not too thin. Also, especially with the drug Coumadin, unless your physician is aware of you're taking aspirin and he prescribes aspirin, you should not take aspirin with Coumadin unless your doctor is aware of it. What are some of the over-the-counter medications I need to avoid with high blood pressure? Uh, some of the over-the-counter medications that uh, you definitely want to avoid with, uh, for high blood pressure is any kind of drug that has a decongestant in it. These might be like pseudoephedrine or something like that. You know, the antihistamines are fine, but a lot of times uh, the antihistamines will have a decongestant in there also. So a lot of times if you're not sure what, because uh, there are a lot of different kind of decongestant, which decongestant is there, please check with your pharmacist. Your pharmacist is a great resource that you can ask him and he can tell you that this medication has a decongestant and therefore should not be taken if you have hypertension. How are diuretics used to help high blood pressure? Diuretics or water pills are another class of medications used to treat hypertension. And the way they work, they get rid of excess fluid and excess salt from your body. So um, the only, probably the biggest side effects of these is sometimes uh, it make you feel a little weak, especially when you first start taking it. Also, obviously, it'll make you go to the bathroom a lot, especially a couple of hours after you take the medication. So you don't definitely want to take it at night. You want to take it in the morning when you can go to the bathroom. 
Also, you got to sometimes watch your electrolytes. Physicians will normally have your electrolytes checked regularly to make sure your potassium or sodium or any other kind of electrolytes don't get too low and could therefore make you feel bad. How do I make sure I'm a compliant patient? Some of the best ways for a patient to be compliant with their medication is one way is to take the pill at the same time every day. Do not take it different, one time in the morning, one time in the afternoon, so you don't forget when you're taking it. Also, use special pill boxes a lot of times that have the days of the week list and you put your medication in there. That's very helpful to, to people that have trouble remembering whether they've taken their medication or not. Also, keep a medicine calendar. Write down on the calendar what time you take each medicine and so that way you'll make sure you uh, take it the correct day. Also, maybe put a sticky note on your refrigerator or your medicine cabinet to remind you. And also, use a calendar and just mark it off each time. Each time you take your medication, mark it off the calendar because sometimes we sometimes forget, have we taken that one or not? So, the, there are a lot of different ways and what's the best way for one person to be compliant is maybe not the best for another. You just have to come up with one of these methods that works best for you. How can I best utilize my pharmacist to assist with my medication needs? Uh, one of the best ways to utilize your pharmacy and your pharmacist is to uh, make sure you get all your medication at one pharmacy whenever possible. That way the pharmacist has your profile so when you get a new prescription filled, he can check or he or she can check to make sure there's no drug interaction or not any kind of drug duplication. And also your pharmacist is one of the best resources you can get to. You do not have to have an appointment. You can walk in any pharmacy or call on the phone and a pharmacist will talk to you at any time. And, they're really a fantastic source of drug information, whether it be uh, what is this medication for, what's the best time of day to take it, what are some of the side effects. And so one of your best resources and easiest uh, accessible resource to get any kind of drug information is from your pharmacist. Hello, my name is Octavia Dales. I'm a public health service coordinator for the Pike County Health Department. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about the hazards of using tobacco in all of its ugly forms. How do you feel that tobacco raises your risk for heart attack and stroke? A lot of people when they think of tobacco use they really think of cancer, uh, specifically lung, but tobacco is not safe in any form and one of the things that is in tobacco of course is the addictive nicotine uh, chemical and that chemical does several things to your body that makes your uh, veins and arteries become smaller. Um, it makes your heart beat faster, and of course we know it's the addictive part of tobacco. But uh, when we've got a heart beating faster and we've got uh, veins and arteries becoming smaller, nothing can get through those veins and arteries like it should. So. Um, this, in fact, really can cause poor circulation. You have definitely trouble with your heart. Your heart can't keep up because nothing is getting in there like it should to furnish all the nutrients, the blood supply that is needed to make it function. So that's one of the biggest risks uh, there is the nicotine. Of course, we know there's lots of other poisons and things. But the number one cause of heart disease is if you're a tobacco user, I mean, it is secondhand smoke, it is tobacco use, number one cause. What makes tobacco so deadly? Well, tobacco has 4,000 chemicals, it has 200 known poisons, and it has 60 that can and do cause cancer. Um, and, you know, we don't think about tar, uh, but tobacco, especially if you're a smoker and you smoke that cigarette, it produces little droplets of tar that goes out into the air and that's why you know anyone especially small children or people that are elderly uh, already have a, maybe some lung function difficulties it makes it so difficult for them because they're going to inhale that all those chemicals those 4,000 chemicals 200 poisons and of course those 60s that can and do cause cancer but those little droplets are tar and uh, you inhale those, you blow those out, and they go down and they sit on your alveolis, your air sacs, and um, they harden. Uh, they'd harden just like they would on a road top. And God gave us this ability to go in and out. Our lungs have this elasticity to breathe in and out. And when you can't uh, breathe out, that's where that alveoli, that will burst, it will just bust and 
uh, hit lets all those 4,000 chemicals, those 200 poisons, those 60 that can and do cause cancer, they go right in there and they start to work. And that's your beginning stages of emphysema. So, uh, and that's just from tar. That's just one chemical. Uh, but then those others come in and they start doing what they know best, and that's just to eat up those uh, veolized, those little air sacs. What are some of those deadly chemicals that can be found in tobacco products? Yes, we have formaldehyde. Uh, formaldehyde, of course, we know is embalming fluid. Um, you uh, do it to preserve. Um, you can do it to preserve animal tissue. You can do it to human tissue. That's what, of course, is in it when we, you know, uh, they embalm us to preserve our body for those two or three days that we're up. Um, you have cadmium, battery acid, you have um, carbon monoxide, you have um, nickel, you have um, acetone, ammonia. Um, you just, uh, that's a few that I can, arsenic, cyanide, uh, that's a few that just I can rattle off real fast, but. Um, None of those are healthy. You know, none of us would take uh, ammonia and drink it. Um, none of us would take arsenic or cyanide for our health, but we, yet we find those, we find those in tobacco. Uh, and, and that's, it just does not ever wash. Tobacco can't be washed. So whatever's in that field is gonna be on it. Nicotine is also grows naturally in the plant of the tobacco. So they, of course, put more in it so we'll be more addictive. So we, we think we can't live without it. Can you tell us a little bit about how carbon monoxide is associated with smoking? We find when a cigarette is lit, it gives off a chemical called carbon monoxide. And we can check that. I, I check that routinely with my clients who come to quit tobacco. Uh, it takes about eight hours to uh, 24 hours to get the carbon monoxide out of your body from smoking. If you smoke one cigarette, it's gonna show. Uh, if you're in a household with heavy smokers, it's gonna show. Uh, you can bring a child in if, if it's with grandma and grandpa and they're smoking, that child's smoking. And we can show what it's smoking. We can show the carbon monoxide levels. And, and that's helped us uh, persuade people not to definitely with the secondhand smoke, not to smoke around others. But what carbon monoxide does, it takes seven seconds for the uh, nicotine to hit the brain and to give you that, you know, oh, I'm gonna be all right. But in the meantime, you're inhaling and you're blowing out carbon monoxide from that lit end of that cigarette. Well, carbon monoxide immediately goes into your bloodstream and the way I explain it is like Pac-Man. It gets in the bloodstream and it starts saying, where's the Oksha John? I'm eating now. And it just starts going, mm, 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 mm. and that's how it does. Even in a smoker, uh, they can become sleepy. Uh, we've had people emit it into the emergency room from carbon monoxide poisoning just from smoking. So uh, it's not a myth, it really happens and um, it's, it's deadly. What do you think the addictive part of tobacco is? Nicotine is the addictive force. Now, if some people say, well, you know, uh, I just don't believe there's that much nicotine in a cigarette or in tobacco. Well, there isn't. But what happens when it goes to the company, they know to sell more cigarettes, what do they have to do to us? They have to make sure that we're going to go back to that store and buy that tobacco because our brain says it cannot do without it. And that's what nicotine does. God gave us our brain. It was our protector. It's always been. That was our main function of the brain, to protect us. But what happens when nicotine or any other drug that is addictive, it changes that brain forever. So once that brain's been changed by nicotine or any other drug, you will see that that brain is no longer our protector. Your heart is beating fast and your veins and arteries are going, oh my goodness, I can't get through here. 
and your brain is saying, I do not care. Drop dead for all I care, but get me that cigarette. I want the nicotine. That's the only thing that it wants. It does not want 4,000 chemicals, 200 poisons, 60 that can and do cause cancer. It does. It just don't want it. But to get it, that nicotine, it's wrapped up in a package of poison. Is spit tobacco a safer alternative to smoking? There is no safe alternative to tobacco. No safe. Does the Pike County Health Department offer smoking cessation classes? We have classes, it's like every 12 weeks, and sometimes I have to offer a, a class all of a sudden. Um, I had a group of six uh, call and they said, we have this many, and I had two classes already going. I had one at two and one at five. And they said, can we get a class? We really want to quit smoking. And I said, sure you can, three o'clock on Tuesday. So anybody out there looking or trying or wanting or thinking about it, <laughs> call the health department. We'll help you. We really will. We'll try our best to anyway. Uh, you have to want it. Uh, probably be one of the hardest things you ever do. But on Tuesdays, we offer classes just about the whole day. Up next, we'll be discussing the effects of diabetes and heart health with Mary Collins, Pikeville Medical Center Diabetes Educator. Diabetes can play a large role in heart health. What are some signs and symptoms of diabetes? You may find that you're feeling things like you're really hungry. No matter how much you eat, you can eat a whole meal. You get up, you're still starved. You can be really thirsty. You drink, drink, drink. Doesn't help. You may be going to the bathroom a whole lot. You may also have some cuts and sores that just aren't healing as fast as you think they should. And your vision may be a little bit blurry. How can I avoid diabetes? Avoiding diabetes is sometimes hard, so no matter what you do, you may still not be able to totally avoid it, but there are some things you can try. You want to look at how you live just a normal, healthy lifestyle, any way anyone should live a healthy lifestyle. Watch what you eat, have a balanced diet, you need some exercise, it's good for everyone, and some weight control. What blood work will my doctor do to find out if I am diabetic? There's a lot of blood work that your doctor can do, but the biggest numbers they're going to be looking at is called your glucose and your A1C level. Now, your glucose can be two ways. They may tell you to be fasting, which means they don't want you to eat or drink anything for about eight hours, or they may want it just random, which means just as you are, you go in and they check it. So what is an A1C test? The A1C test is kind of like a tattletale test. It gives your doctor or your primary care provider an idea of how your blood sugar's been doing over the last three months. It's an estimated average. It tells us how much glucose or sugar has been stuck onto that red blood cell. So what does being diabetic have to do with heart disease? If you are diabetic, you are what's known as a heart risk equivalent. This means you are at the same exact risk as someone that's already had a heart attack for having another heart attack whether they're diabetic or not. If I'm diabetic and I've not had a heart attack but you have had a heart attack, we're at the same risk. How can I treat diabetes? Lifestyle modification, diet and exercise, weight control is key. Sometimes those aren't enough though and we've got to give you a little bit of extra help. Your primary care provider may want to do some things like medicines. You'll hear about pills. Those are usually oral glucose lowering agents. They may call them that too. There's different kinds of shots, which everyone tends to be scared of, but it's okay. There's some non-insulin injectables as well as insulin. Does being diabetic mean that I can't have any carbohydrates at all? Absolutely not. All foods can fit into a well-balanced meal plan. The key is to make sure your meal plan is well balanced. We want to watch portion control, which is really hard for all of us. But any food, we can usually work into your meal plan. Does being diabetic mean that I need to join a gym? You don't have to join a gym. Exercise is something you can do in the comforts of your home or even local tracks. Many places have parks that you can walk around. Find a buddy, do a buddy system, have someone to be with you to be your accountability, your support, and to motivate you. What's the best advice that a diabetes educator can give me about diabetes? The best advice from a diabetes educator would be to keep a watch on your total lifestyle. Remember those healthy lifestyle modifications, diet, exercise, and weight control? 
remember to follow up with your family doctor so they can help you keep a watch on your risk factors and try your best. Hi, I'm Sarah Evans. I'm one of the registered dietitians over at Pikeville Medical Center. I am one of the dietitians who works with the patients that are in the hospital as well as doing diabetes education uh, over at Dr. Chang and Dr. Katan's office. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about a heart healthy diet. What is considered a heart healthy diet? Well, uh, a heart healthy diet is one that's lower in sodium and lower in cholesterol. Um, some of these heart healthy diets that you might have heard of before are the DASH diet, which is Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, um, and that's a diet that focuses on lower amounts of sodium in the diet, as well as the TLC diet, which is Total Lifestyle Changes Diet, and it focuses on a lower amount of cholesterol and fat in the diet. Um, other things to that are important in part to be part of a heart healthy nutri heart healthy nutrition include a variety of foods and vegetables from all of the food groups as well as an adequate amount of fiber in the diet as well um, a good mix of all of these together are going to give you enough of what you need to support the body and heart health i know there are good fats and bad fats could you explain the difference and tell me how much i should have in my diet when we talk about fat and eating fat, uh, we are trying to cut down on the amount of fat that we eat to um, reduce the amount of LDL cholesterol in our bodies, which is low density lipo lipoprotein cholesterol, which is the bad fat in our body. Um, we also are eating fats in a way to increase the amount of HDL cholesterol, which is high density lipoprotein cholesterol, which when we have more HDL cholesterol in our body, um, this helps, get, helps our body get rid of the LDL, that bad cholesterol. Um, but let's talk about bad fats. Uh, bad fats in our diets that we eat are uh, saturated fats, trans fats, and cholesterol. Uh, foods that are high in, trans, uh, in saturated fats include fatty meats, uh, poultry skin, bacon, sausage, whole milk, cream, and butter. Uh, trans fats and things that we will want to avoid as well um, are going to be found in stick margarines, shortenings, some fried foods, and packaged foods made with hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated oils. Uh, both trans fats and saturated fats are typically solid when they're at room temperature. Um, I mentioned cholesterol as being one of these bad fats as well. Um, this bad fat, uh, this, this is a bad fat and it should be limited to about 200 milligrams per day. Uh, foods that are high in cholesterol include egg yolks, fatty meat, whole milk, cheese, shrimp, lobster, and crab. Now let's talk about the good fats, the good fats that we are gonna eat. Um, these good heart healthy fats include mono and polyunsaturated fats with omega-3 fatty acids as being one of those. Uh, food sources of these good fats include olive oil, canola oil, soybean oil, flaxseed, flaxseed oil, nuts, uh, and fatty fish like salmon, tuna, and mackerel. Uh, overall though, the discussion about fat, we still need to reduce the amount of fat in our diet. Um, the amount that should be consumed should be limited to 25 to 35 percent of our overall calories. So this means if you are consuming about 2,000 calories per day, the amount of fat that you should have of both good fat and bad fat should be limited to about 50 to 75 grams of fat per day. Now, of course, if you eat more calories, you're going to have more fat, and if you eat less calories, you're going to have less fat. But overall, it's going to be uh, 25 to 35 percent of your total day's calories, or that's where your fat's going to come from. How can we cut back on the bad fats and include more of the good fats? So to limit these bad fats, we are going to need to do a few things. Um, we could do things like cutting the visible fat from meat, uh, limiting the amount of saturated fats um, by choosing leaner meats uh, and avoiding organ meats such as sweetbreads, things like that. Uh, we want to choose lower fat dairy, uh, milk that is going to be 
uh, have a milk fat, milk fat percentage of 1% or less. Uh, we sometimes might want to try swapping out meat for a vegetable protein instead every once in a while. Um, definitely going to need to start skipping those egg yolks. Um, we will try to eat the egg whites instead and maybe try a egg substitute product as well. We also want to avoid high fat bakery products um, and that are made with hydrogenated oils, avoid frying foods, and whenever possible avoid using butter or cream. To add these good fats to our diet, we want to try to use some of those heart healthy oils that I talked about, um, use some nuts, some seeds, um, and, and include that fatty fish in our diet as well. Um, a good recommendation would be to eat about uh, two servings of fatty fish a week. Um, as for a replacement for that butter, we might try a margarine spread that's made with uh, one of those good oils that we talked about. What is sodium and how much should we be consuming? Sodium is a mineral that is found in food with the main source being salt. Um, limiting the amount of sodium in your diet by what you eat and by what you drink is going to, going to help with your overall all heart health and prevent future heart problems. Um, for example, uh, individuals with heart failure, uh, if, we, if they consume too much sodium, it can result in an increase of fluid around the lungs, in the heart, and in the legs. This is not so good because it makes the heart work harder and can also increase your blood pressure. So we need to limit salt in our, and sodium in our diet. Um, also to note though, if you are on a, a medication to lower your blood pressure, it's still important to lower sodium in your diet. Uh, so how much should we have? This should definitely be limited to about 1,500 to 2,400 milligrams of sodium each day. In terms of salting your food, this is going to be about one-eighth of a teaspoon of table salt, or if you're using light salt, you can use about one-quarter, one-fourth of a, table, a teaspoon of that product. What are the foods that are not recommended when we're trying to be heart healthy, and how can we cut back on the sodium in our diet? Well, of course, salt is not recommended. You're going to stick with that recommended amount that I just told you about. Uh, but I also wanted to mention sea salt. A lot of people ask me about that. They say they've heard it's better for you and you should use that instead. Well, sea salt still has sodium in it. So you can use that product if you like it, but you'll, and you might just be able to use more of that than your regular table salt, but it still has sodium in it and it's going to need to be limited. Other foods to not to avoid would include processed foods like canned foods, frozen foods, frozen dinners, snack foods, uh, packaged meals like things like ramen noodles, instant foods, instant cooking mixes, uh, canned meats, and processed cheese. Basically, the less you have to do to prepare the product, in general, usually it has more sodium in it. Um, all we also need to watch out for condiments, things like mustard, ketchup, salad dressings, uh, bouillon cubes, some sauces like barbecue sauce, meat tenderizers, and uh, se other seasoned salts are also going to be high in sodium. Um, and also to mention, we need to remember to avoid these uh, pickled items like pickled cucumbers or pickled corn and olives because those are also high in sodium. The biggest thing that you can do to help cut back in, on the sodium in your diet is going to be to start reading nutrition labels. Um, you'll really be surprised at how much sodium some of these products have. Um, it's a good idea to select products or foods that have about 140 milligrams of sodium or less per serving. Now if you're trying out maybe a frozen dinner or frozen entree, whether it's a regular product or advertised maybe as a, a weight loss product, promotion product. Um, you want to check the sodium level on that as well. Um, if it has 300 milligrams of sodium or more, this might be something that you want to eliminate from your diet as it doesn't fit in with your new heart healthy diet. Um, we also want to talk about cooking because the more you can cook your food, uh, the more control you have over the amount of sodium in it. Um, Try to salt your food as little as possible during the cooking process, and you can try seasoning your food with tart flavors like lemon or lime. 
Uh, you can also try hot flavors like peppers or hot sauce. Now I did say that hot sauce had some sodium in it, but if you only use about a drop or two, it's not going to be enough to hurt. Um, using herbs and spices and other salt-free seasonings like Mrs. Dash are also a good idea too. Uh, we also want to uh, let you know that you need to use some caution when you're eating out. Uh, when we eat out, typically the food definitely, typically the food has more sodium in it than what we would prepare for ourselves at home. Um, you can always, whether this is a fast food restaurant or a family sit down restaurant, um, this is usually the, t the case because they want the food to taste so good. Um, you can always ask for nutrition information on your on the food that you've selected and even in those nicer restaurants you could maybe ask how the food is prepared and if it's prepared with salt you might be able to ask them to hold the salt for you. What do we need to know about fiber and heart health? Eating plenty of fiber is also good for a heart healthy diet and, we, and we're going to do this by eating plenty of vegetables, fruits, and uh, whole grains because they are higher in fiber. Now what we need to know about fiber is that there are two different types of fiber. We've got soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber is especially helpful in lowering that LDL, that bad cholesterol, so we want to include more of that in our diet. Um, a heart healthy fiber goal would be to include about 25, 10 to 25 grams of soluble fiber per day. Um, if you're just starting out getting, getting some fiber in your diet, things you might want to do would be to add this gradually and drink plenty of fluids just to avoid any gastric discomfort. Um, things you can do to add fiber to your diet um, could be as simple as adding uh, oat bran or rice bran to the cereal that you already eat or the yogurt that you already eat in the morning. Um, you could add some extra dried beans to soups um, or um, mixing flax seeds or other uh, oats into muffins would also be a way just to add some fiber to what you're already making. Um, we want to recommend that you eat whole fruits and vegetables versus juice because you're getting that whole added benefit of the fiber in the, in the whole fruit or vegetable. Um, and so vegetables that we would recommend that are high in soluble fiber include Brussels sprouts, acorn squash, lima beans, broccoli, okra, and eggplant. Uh, we also want to look for whole grain products and especially those with oats and barley. Uh, other things that we could try to do to inc increase the fiber in our diet might be to add vegetables to sandwiches, um, but maybe you don't like that, so it might just be as easy as trying a whole grain, whole grain bread on your sandwich versus white bread. Um, things you can do for snacks might be trying bean dips or uh, hummus dips are also high in fiber. Is there anything else people should know about heart healthy nutrition? Well, it's very important um, to you and to your health and to your future. Um, heart healthy nutrition really it starts with you. Uh, only you can change what you eat and modifying your diet is really one of the most beneficial things that you can do to improve your health. So uh, eat up. Thank you for joining us for Health Talk. If you have questions about heart health, please contact Pikeville Medical Center at 218 three five zero zero.